Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, the acrid smell of burning electronics beneath a beautiful indigo sky on a summer's night. And I'm here to finally do the final episode of my Let's Play of Mirror's Edge. Uh, unfortunately there's been a gap between the rest of the series and this episode, but hopefully that won't be too much of a problem. Um, if you're watching this in the future, that won't be any different at all. If you're watching this right now, maybe you want to go back and re-watch some episodes. I don't know if you care enough. Uh, because we left off on kind of a cliffhanger, and it was... Uh, I mean, I know this is a game primarily about dangling off the edges of things, but I shouldn't really leave cliffhangers for too long. So, let's jump right in. I can't believe you've done all this. You're my sister. Take this. It's Mark. He's a friend. He'll guide you away from here. I'll lead the blues away. Come and find you later, okay? Oh, God. Oh. Mark. I couldn't stop them. They took Kate. I got some of the bastards, though. Where'd they go? I heard them mention the shard. The mayor's place? <coughs> Let me get someone, a doctor. That ain't gonna happen, Faith. I'm sorry, Mark. I'm so sorry. No, no sorries. Just don't let them win. I won't, Mark. I promise. Thanks, kiddo. So here we are at the end of the game, and as one of my favourite tracks on the soundtrack plays, I want to just point out a couple things. First off, here we are finally at the centre of the game. In every chapter you've been able to see this in the backdrop. Wherever you are in the city, you're always aware that you're being watched, looked down upon from this central spire. So uh, it's cool that we're here and we're finally going to go inside, I guess, um, but there was something else I wanted to mention. Which is that, notice that it's early evening. This game doesn't take place over the course of one day, but its chapters go from starting in the early morning to here in the evening. And uh, even the last couple chapters were in early evening. So there is this perception of time passing, which means that if you play through this in one or two sittings, even though multiple days are passing for the characters, you have this sensation of time passing for you as well as you go. I think it's clever and very subtle. Um, but after something clever and very subtle, let's experience the stupidest moment in this, a game where you regularly jump, regularly jump off of rooftops for money. So I don't know a lot about the physics of gas explosions, but I'm pretty sure that a detonation large enough to knock a door off its hinges, um, it does not respect line of sight. I'm pretty sure that uh, pressure waves tend to fill any space that's given to them, and I'm pretty sure that just ducking into that side passage is not going to protect you from a large fireball. Uh, regardless, it served our purposes. So um, if that was a door that we couldn't have just kicked down with our immense leg strength, then I really think Faith should be dead after that. 
There's a few different animations for those uh, first-person disarms, and unfortunately we didn't get the one I wanted because there's a moment um, where the cop's eyes open in horror as he sees your... Uh, not armoured, but your, um, let's say, muscular and knobbly kneecap heading towards his nose, and his mouth pops open, and it's kind of funny. This is a that's actually usually a fairly long and difficult segment, but um, if you do it like that, you can just zip straight through with no trouble. There's something very amusing about this chair just by itself in a spotlight. It feels like uh, some kind of incredibly loaded image from an opening shot of a David Lynch program, but... Good work. Check her. Gonna shoot me too? No. Right now, you're Cake's best hope. Weren't these your guys? No, they're PKs. Pirandella Kruger. Private security. What's going on, Miller? Hope's murder. Turns out there was a man on the inside. Rope burn? Yes. You were right about him. I tried to get answers myself. But why Kate? They needed a CPF cop to look like Pope's killer. No time to explain more. Take this comms unit and head for the roof. It's where they've taken Kate. I'll contact you when it's safe. I'll hold them off. The roof. Go. Now. So this is going to be important relating to some stuff I'm going to talk about during the credits. Um, but for now, it's time for one of the more frustrating combat segments in this. Uh, the final level. You don't need to fight any of these guys, you can just run past them and um, do the stylish Tracer's cool guy thing. But um, it's pretty hit and miss. One of the flaws in this game is how randomized the uh, likelihood of you getting shot is. You need to wait for this to open, which means that you basically... Um, when you sprint out in front of that hail of bullets, it's fairly likely that you just... Uh, <laughs> get a bad dice roll and die instantaneously. On the other hand, you could spend ages uh, running around and taking them all out individually. We like the fast option because this is a game about being fast. I believe the real shard in London also has a bunch of uh, tourist tat that you can buy from it. Although I have only been to it once. Hey, are you reading me? I'm in the security room, tracking you on the cameras. Get out of the elevator, they're coming. So, naturally, if you get hit by an elevator, you die instantaneously. But this is actually one of the more frustrating platforming sections in the game, because it's not immediately obvious what you should do, and oh, most of the up. things you can attempt... Oh yeah, also they do... <laughs> Uh, they do open the door to have a look and see if you're still in there, and then they're just confused where you've gone. There's a hatch hanging up in the ceiling, but she couldn't possibly have escaped out of there, could she? So, um, it looks like a jump you can't make, but you're supposed to jump over there and grab on, then climb down the ladder, but that's slow and irritating. What I tend to do is drop onto this, jump over here, and then land on this pipe. It's finicky and it doesn't always work, so I'll also do it the proper way. If you do it right, it's great. Uh, you can also just drop down here and grab on, which is also a lot faster than... It's also kind of dangerous. So the important thing we learn here is that this is exactly why you shouldn't try to do parkour inside lift shafts in real life. It's generally a bad idea. Maybe I'm just going to edit all of these out. Future Tessa here with a quick overdub, basically just to say that the main problems with this section are pretty small. One is that your landing zones tend to be really really quite tiny and finicky, which is really difficult to land on. The other is actually the same as why it's possible to find a lot of fast routes down here, which is that there are all these small sticky outy details which have physics enabled. You can use those to get down fast, but they can also get in the way of trying to do the proper route. 
So, now that we're finally through that awful piece, uh, we can move straight on. There's something amusing here, which is that the semiotics of the game breaks down, and I don't really mean semiotics in the usual sense of the symbolic meaning of things, I mean the way that um, things are communicated to the player in a game. Every time we've seen things that are visibly jutting out from a wall like that previously, they have had actual physics collision, which means that if you run into them, you bounce off the wall and die. So, for my entire childhood obsession with this game, I thought you couldn't wall run on that wall and therefore you had to take the very slow shimmy to get past this column. But you can actually just... And it's fine and significantly faster. So this is one of the rare times where it's uh, conventions of visuals break down. However, it then leads into this really, really lovely area. I love the golden glow of these, uh, you know, mechanical work lights reflecting a thousand times off of all of these shiny interior surfaces. Must be a very new uh, skyscraper that it's not full of grot and grime yet. And through here, there is a little uh, little room here. I've always wondered what was in here, of course. <laughs> uh, it's almost certainly where a bag was the first time I played this, so... Um, on the other hand, maybe it's not. That's completely a guess, because I don't want to have to reset my data to find out. Now over here is something that stumped me for a really long time. When I played this as an, as an obsessive teenager, I knew that bag was there. I never, ever found out how to reach it. So imagine my surprise when I did my first practice playthrough for this. Um, a few weeks ago now. Uh, God, maybe even a, more than a month ago because of the hiatus. Um, I realized you could just wall run inside and get up here. So here again is a reference to the November Riots, which have only been mentioned a couple times, but which are very important and which I will be bringing up later. I was too young to remember exactly how it started. The authorities said the changes were for the greater good. But good isn't the same as right. So, as I always say, bonus points for outright stating the themes of the game. Although, um, to what extent... I suppose you could very well say that the greater good has been served in this metropolis. After all, it seems like most of the people do live these kind of happy middle-class lives working in glass skyscrapers. We never actually see any poverty. And it might be that um, we just don't go to the parts of the city where the poverty is, but we do see high-density housing and so on. Now, I'm going to hand off to future Tessa to do commentary here because this is a notoriously difficult segment for reasons that she will explain. I see you now. There's a sniper team guarding this area. You can get back in on the other side. Be careful, babe. So, yeah, it's me. I'm back again. Uh, I'm didn't, I didn't quite manage this as smoothly as I would have liked, however, uh, I did manage it all in one attempt, which is unusual. When I'm playing this casually, I normally take uh, three or four tries to get through this area. There's a couple reasons why it's difficult, but the main one is that you just have to keep moving no matter what. If you stop for a moment, um, you'll either be shot to bits by the sniper team, or you'll be shot to bits by the on-foot pursuers, which uh, enter at this point. Uh, they chase you through the level on foot and will machine gun you if you don't keep moving. This means that even though you do need to take out these snipers, because otherwise they will stop you getting through the door at the end of this section, um, you have to sprint the entire time, which means that you have to either know exactly where you're going or be operating completely on instinct and identify where you need to go. Ideally, you land on that pipe and scurry across, but if you fail to do that, there's a backup. You can come in through the back here, which uh, is a bit risky. But they both lead to the same location, which is the third sniper you need to take out to be able to get across. <laughs> There's actually an explosive barrel right next to him, which means that the machine gunners often just explode you while you're dealing with him. So it really is stacked against you in this zone. Finally, um, that jump is quite difficult and you often end up dangling. If you're dangling, you can get machine gunned. And I'm back as we run into the most crowded corridor I've ever seen. There's an elevator ahead. I've managed to unlock it. Take it to the server room. You should be able to get to the top floors and gate from there. I've been in some corporate offices in my life. Not many, but enough. And I know that squeezing seating areas into corridors is not uncommon. However, um, I've never seen an office try and squeeze an entire conference room into a corridor. It just seems like it's a fire hazard, frankly. So, we're going to get one of the best views in the game as we go up here. 
it really does reinforce this um i love the symbolism of the of the shard this one tower looking down over the city and how it's uh, literally reinforced because the shard is where the entire city-wide surveillance system is ha is housed so it really is watching everything you do it looks like the security doors to the roof are closed okay if you destroy those servers their emergency protocol should automatically unlock the doors i hope good luck faith so it's going to be time to hand off to future tessa again uh she's getting a lot of outings in this episode anyway here we go look around surveillance for the whole city right under your nose faith Sounds like they've taken Kate to the roof. They've got a chopper coming in. You'll have to be quick. What the You might notice that those two Pirandello crew guys just um, disappeared and turned into grenades, which is a neat trick if you can manage it. There's a fun thing here, which is that um, non-pursuit type enemies, if they basically go off the ground at all, they instantaneously die. Which means that if you time it right, you can sprint up the stairs, kick that guy, and he bounces back off of, you know, about a four foot drop, but instantly is knocked out. There's two main ways through this section. One is the cool guy method, which is what I'm trying to pull off here, which uh, basically involves sprinting between the machines as fast as possible so that they try and shoot you, but shoot their own servers instead. Um, if you do that right and manage one of the cool circuitu circuitous routes through this area, it looks great. Um, also, there is a pipe on the ceiling you can swing off here, but I missed it. So, um, yeah, the other method is to just knock all the guys out and use their guns to shoot the servers yourself, which is faster, but a lot less stylish. You do still need to knock out a few of the guys, though, because that machine gun guy up on the, uh, up on the top, he is basically the final boss of this game. There will be an actual boss section very shortly, however, that guy, yeah, you have to take him out. If you try and run past him, he kills you. Uh, if you try and take him out, the other guys shoot you while you do that. So basically, you have to take a couple guys out to buy yourself a window of time to take this guy out so that you can get through the area. There's also something I wanted to bring up. Actually, I should mention first, this took about 15 attempts. It normally takes me 6 or 7 on my casual playthroughs. Um, I don't know, my mojo really wasn't at it today. But yeah, you get the real deal with me. I don't hide everything in edits. I'm honest about having fucked everything up repeatedly. So uh, that's me, the Let's Play YouTuber you can trust. Finally, we are about to see a cutscene with guys with guns in. After the final boss fight, uh, there's a cutscene where you can see those guys are knocked out on the rooftop in the background. That's because you were supposed to fight them as part of a much longer final fight that was actually cut from the game. surrounding Pope's demise. It's why you're still alive. You can't live on the edge all your life, Faith. Sooner or later, you have to jump. See, Jackknife loses points for sounding like he's stating a theme of the game, but actually the idea that you can't keep living on the edge your whole life uh, really isn't one. <laughs> So this game ends where it began, as the theme song kicks in, dangling from a helicopter. I love that 
we also end with one of these tender moments. And it's here that the first person cutscenes break for the first time. We are done being Faith. Faith's story is finished. We don't need to be her anymore. But I'm glad they chose after the hug for that to happen, because it's a strange moment of tenderness that really isn't present in games, generally. Even first-person games tend to have third-person cutscenes, and even the ones that have first-person cutscenes don't tend to have these kind of... emotional moments of that kind of... I've said it before, but tenderness. And that's Mirror's Edge, as the theme song really kicks into gear. So, there's something beautifully bittersweet about this ending, as the camera flies up, happy with its emotional catharsis, but not really having uh, actually changed anything. And I think that's really interesting, because it's very unusual that a game will go for that particular kind of story and that particular kind of ending. Game narratives are kind of childish a lot of the time. There's this concept that you're the special person who solves the problem. You know, you're the person around whom history bends. But a lot of problems in real life are systemic and vast. One person can't really fix everything, or indeed anything. In the end, all Faith actually achieves is that she rescues her sister. She saves one person. And in the process of doing so, she still loses everyone else she cares about. Her friend betrays her. Her father figure dies protecting her. Her sister is the one she saves, but she loses her entire society. It would have been possible for there to be a more optimistic ending to this game. In a moment, there's going to be a, uh, a, a news article just to give a little coda to the thing, to the end of the game, but um, it shows that ultimately Faith's actions just fed back into the propaganda machine that controls this society. You know, there's no evil wizard for her to overthrow, there's no giant Nazi to kill that solves Nazism, there's no big boss guy to beat, because <laughs> in the end it's the systems and structures of society that are the enemy, I guess. Or at least this society. And that is a remarkably... Like I've said, it's an unusual um, narrative to choose, especially for a AAA game from, you know, major studios. Um, but it's also unusual in a culture of games where games aren't usually about things, and the games that are about things tend to be indie games. Um, and even then, they tend to speak to emotional truths rather than any kind of political manifesto. A brazen terrorist attack at the Shard has left nine people dead and many more injured. According to a Callahan staff member, a security breach led to a series of catastrophic outages in the Shard's many public protection systems, causing havoc not just at the Shard, but throughout the city. The suspects in the act are none other than the former CPF officer and accused murderer Kate Connors and her sister Faith Connors. Although the scope and precise cause of the outages is as yet unclear, many troubling questions have emerged in their wake, including the role of the so-called runners in the destabilization of city operations. In the aftermath of the incident, local security firm Pirandello Kruger will be assisting the CPF. PK and the mayor's office have also recommended mobile phone and email be used sparingly until additional security measures have been deployed, as their security has been temporarily compromised. The whereabouts of both suspects are currently unknown. So, as you just heard, in the end it all fed back into Callahan's Planahan. Which, now that I think about it... Huh. <laughs> so... Callahan had Pope murdered because Pope found out about Callahan's secret plan to start a new kind of cop that would um, be able to wipe out a criminal underground organization. While I don't agree with the politics of any of that, 
The logic there doesn't make sense. Why did it need to be kept a secret? Why would going public with, we are creating a task force to deal with those guys that we have been outputting propaganda for decades are, are a problem? Wouldn't it be even kind of a, a coup in the news to be able to say we're starting a task force that can solve this last societal problem that we have? Not that that is the last societal problem that they have, but that's how they would spin it, right? So why was it necessary to cover it up to begin with? Anyway, um, that aside, there's something else I want to talk about briefly, which is that... Well, there's two connected things. One is that in a culture of weak satire, or a culture of no satire, because again, the vast majority of mainstream games aren't really about anything. Or if they are about things, it's extremely facile themes, like, um, you know, killing wizards to save the world. So... In a, um, in a culture of no satire, weak satire becomes strong satire just by the absence of it. So by having relatively flimsy takes about police states being bad, somehow the total absence of anything else means that when you play this game, it feels a lot more meaningful and a lot more powerful on its themes than it actually is. And if you read a little bit deeper, it actually is reinforcing a lot of things that I think in the modern day and age, you know, more than a decade after this game came out, are much more widely considered to be problematic. They're, <laughs> to use a certain word with certain weight. Um, because there is a dissonance between what the experience of playing the game teaches you and what its actual characters and narrative teach you. Some of them, anyway. After all, this is a game about how the police state is bad, that features the good cops. Miller is on your side. You know, your sister is a good cop in that archetypical form. So, yeah, what, what you're doing when you're running through the game is you're running away from the police who shoot at you for no reason. That teaches you to not trust the police. But in terms of the narrative, those people aren't the police. Those people are corporate. And the games industry has always been way, way more comfortable being anti-corporate, which is ironic, considering it consists of huge corporations that frequently, um, you know, abuse their employees. Uh, it's, it's much more comfortable being anti-corporate than it is being anti-state. Um, and particularly anti-police. And there is, you know, obviously I'm not American, but there is this whole culture of police worship, both in the UK and especially in America. So... The idea that this is actually a kind of an anti-establishment game is 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 ultimately flawed by the fact that the actual cops in the game are almost universally on your side. But as you're playing the game, the people you're seeing and interpreting as cops aren't. So that isn't exactly the point I wanted to end on, because I've been rambling a lot while the credits roll, but um, that actually is going to be... All from me, I think, at this point. Oh, hold on. There was one thing I wanted to talk about, which is that... Um, I think I mentioned this earlier before I got distracted by something else, but there was an alternate way this game could have ended, where that little coda in the news doesn't tell us... You know, it's not a piece of propaganda output, it's actual news, that perhaps the November riots have reignited after a week's worth of police helicopters machine-gunning residential areas because really, if anything would trigger widespread rioting, I think it would probably be people who felt safe suddenly watching the people they believed were there to keep them safe. Machine gun, not, um, you know, working class and minority people out on the other parts of the city, but their, their fancy, shiny office buildings. Surely that's the only thing at this point that could flip that opinion. But I think that if the game had taken that route and had that be the ending, rather than this much more quiet, much more bittersweet ending, where Faith has achieved her goal, she's rescued her sister, but nothing else has changed. I actually think that would undercut the themes of the game for all of those reasons I've just been talking about over the past God, who, God knows how many minutes. Anyway, before my voice completely gives out, that's going to be all from me. Thank you so much for watching and coming with me on this journey through one of my favourite games.
I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to like and subscribe and check out the links in the description. Thank you so much for watching.